All right, so um, first thing we really need to do today is sort of get through just the ordinary business stuff uh, on the syllabus. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my office hours are posted here on the syllabus, right? I'm in the office Monday, Wednesday, 11 to 2, and Tuesday, Thursday, 12.30 to 2. So if you need to talk to me about something, and I'm sure several of you will at various points in the semester, especially because I am encouraging you before you lead discussion to come and talk with me um, <clears throat> to make sure that you're putting everything together in the right way and just to give you a little bit of extra structure. Um, you can reach me at michael.moyer at gsw.edu. I check my email fairly frequently. Um, I will usually get back to you within 24 hours. Please only email me at this address, right? Just use my campus email. Georgia View doesn't sync up to it, so don't use the email widget in Georgia View. I never check that. So, you know, you could have something very, very important that you want me to know about. You know, you, you can't be in class because of a medical emergency or you need help with a project or whatever, and it's just going to sit there in that Georgia View box, and I'm never going to know you needed my help, right? So, Please make sure that you are always using my campus address uh, to contact me. Uh, right, so anything else that's particularly important here? Um, okay, textbook. There is one required textbook for this class. And pretty much everything on the syllabus is in this book, right? Um, it is available at the bookstore. You can also find other cheaper ways to get it. I really don't care how you get it, right? The point is that you get it uh, somehow, quickly. Uh, now, if you are going to have trouble acquiring a copy of the textbook in, say, the first two weeks, let me know. We'll figure something out, you know, whether, you know, I photocopy some pages for you for a few days or we arrange for you to share with a classmate or whatever, right? Um, but yeah, you are going to need this, so you're going to have to get it at some point. Earlier rather than later. All right, uh, as far as what you're going to be graded on, so that's on the second page of the syllabus here, uh, right next to the little Karl Marx Valentine. So there are going to be two exams. They will be very similar in structure, a uh, midterm and a final. Uh, both will include um, a matching section, so I will give you sort of like a brief summary sentence of a particular thinker's major critical position, and you'll match it to that thinker, right? The second half is going to be an essay section. The final exam will include both the matching and the essay sections, and will also include some IDs, right? So you will have to, you know, I'll give you some theory terms. You'll have to tell me what it means and which thinker it's associated with, right? Most closely associated with. Some may have more than one correct answer. Um, so I do expect you to bring the book to class with you once you have it. Um, in general, it's going to be a good idea to bring the syllabus with you to class every day as well. Um, oh, you will also have, there will also be a final paper. Um, <clears throat> this will actually constitute the bulk of your grade at 35%. Um, you will get to choose any text you like and apply any particular theory that you like to it. So that's going to be largely up to you. Um, the, uh, Discussion leader, uh, the discussion leader days, uh, the workshops we'll talk about in just a minute, you have a sheet for that, and participation will be worth 10%, right? So today, I'm gonna be doing a lot of talking. I really, really hope in future sessions that you guys will be speaking up a bit more. Um, right, so make sure that you bring the textbook as well as the syllabus and paper for notes, pen and whatnot, to, to class with you every time. Um, if you have a disability that requires accommodation, as early as possible, please go to the Disability Services Office, which is on the third floor of the Student Services Building, because that makes sense, right? Um, yeah, well, they, they have an elevator. We do not. Um, 
not have point D. But yeah, so they will send me a form with your name on it. They'll tell me what accommodations you require. They will never tell me what your disability is because it's not my business. Um, and I will sign it, send it back to them, and you will get those accommodations, right? So usually the kinds of accommodations they give you are like extra testing time, um, or require them to take tests and things like that, right? Um, so if you, if you require any kinds of accommodations, please go through disability services uh, for that. Don't go through me. They will come to me. All right, attendance. You'll be permitted three absences from this course. Three shall be the number you are permitted, and the number you are permitted shall be three. I mean, three is a magic number. What's that? I hear it's a magic number. It is, yeah. So three. Three, okay. yes, okay. three. Um, think of them as being like personal days at a job, right? You get a limited number. And if you exceed that number, then you are penalized, right? So save them for something important. I know this is a 9.30 Monday class, and none of us really feel like being here. At nine, I, I, I'm correct in that, right? That <laughs> if, 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 that if any of us had chosen the time for a critical theory, it would not have been 9.30 on a Monday. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. Like you, you guys are lucky that I'm here and wearing pants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> keep that up. <laughs> um, so, for every absence beyond the third, right, you'll lose two points from your final average. So please just keep that in mind. Now, if you are genuinely sick, like if you if you have some sort of issue that is going to require you to miss a lot of class, you know, it's a family issue, an illness, whatever, right? Then let me know about it beforehand, and we can find some way to accommodate you, right? Um, okay. I also like to begin class right on time, right? Today we waited a little bit for people who ultimately never showed up. Um, but generally, I am going to start right at 9.30, whether you're here or not. And I'm not going to go back and repeat myself. Right, so be here at 9.30. Um, okay, what else, what else, what else? Okay. Um, I do give extra credit for students who uh, visit the Writing Center, even though this is an upper division course, right? You should all be perfectly capable of writing a seven to 10 page paper on your own. Um, I do still give extra credit to people who go and seek out extra help. So if you go to the Writing Center to work on your paper, um, you will receive half a letter grades extra credit which is actually fairly significant, right? You know, turn that C, that C plus into a B minus, yeah? Um, <clears throat> does everybody know, by the way, where the Writing Center is now? Yeah, it's in the library now on the first floor, right? They moved from the ACE building because the air conditioner in that building doesn't work. So, uh, yeah, so they are now in, um, they're now on the first floor of the library. Um, I have to update the syllabus anyway, so I will, you know, I when I update it, I'll change that to reflect that. Um, Any little group study thing on the first floor? Uh, yeah, they're kind of like along the front wall. There, you know, where there's that lab mm -hmm. um, where John Wilson conducts the oh, research methods okay. classes. They're along there somewhere. Yeah, they don't actually have a room number. Dr. DePaula just told me to say first floor of library. It's in the back corner. It's the back corner? Yeah, you'll be if I use obvious. You know, okay. You go towards the uh -huh. left, you go towards the left. Back. Thanks, Jeremy. All right. Um, so, um, cell phones and other devices. Uh, most of you who have been in class with me before uh, know that I think that the invention of the smartphone uh, marks the unstoppable decline of our civilization. And, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, we're, we're doomed. Um, <clears throat> so, in general, right, I do not want to see phones or laptops or anything out, right, from the moment you enter my classroom. And part of it, this is not just me being um, middle-aged technophobic dick, right? <laughs> um, the reason for this is that if your phone is out, it's a, dra it's a drag on your attention. 
if your phone is out, if you have a computer out, it's a drag on your classmates' attention, right? So in order to be fully focused and fully present, please just make sure that the phones are, are, are put away, right? This is also one of the reasons why I would prefer, if you can afford to do so, that you get a physical copy of the textbook rather than an ebook copy. I mean, the other benefit of having a physical copy right you can scribble in it and if you are not doing that to your books that is something you should be doing to your books right um, <clears throat> what's that you're not allowed to if you rent you're not allowed to if you rent them that's true so <laughs> it gets you know yeah post-its photocopy pa uh, pages and scribble on those even just take notes while you're writing right you can highlight a rental book but not scribble well and and the other th the, the reason I suggest scribbling or like actually writing in your books rather than highlighting is that highlighting is actually basically useless, right? It just draws your eye to it. Yeah, it draws your eye to the thing that you marked, but there's no notation there as to why you marked this in the first place, right? So if you really, really want to retain what you read, if you want, yeah, write. Write little notes next to passages you think are important, right? Write little questions that you have. But like, what does this mean, you know? Write ideas that you have, you know? Write little summer, like some synopses of difficult passages, right? You know, maybe little paraphrases, right? Okay, this is what this means. And that'll also get you thinking a little bit more deeply about what you read, right? The more physically engaged you are with it, the more deeply you'll think about it. So that is why I suggest all the scribbling. Um, okay, but the point of this, right, was no electronic devices, yeah? And I kind of wandered off topic. Okay. Um, academic dishonesty. Um, so here's what happens if you're caught plagiarizing in one of my classes, right? In general, I mean, there's really only one big written assignment here, right? So you basically only have one chance to fuck up. Um, <clears throat> Right, uh, so if any portions of that work are drawn from an unattributed source, right? So if you copied and pasted from a website, if you've bought a paper that someone has copied and pasted from various websites, because that's typically what they do if you buy a paper, um, then it's an automatic F on the paper. Now, because the final paper constitutes 35% of your grade, it is also virtually impossible to pass if you get an F on that paper, right? So, getting caught plagiarizing this class basically functionally means automatic failure. So, you know, since this comes at the end of the semester, right, please, please, please do not, do not risk everything you've already worked towards on a plagiarized paper. Okay, does anybody have any questions about any of these policies? Everybody good? Okay, um, so just a couple more things that about the syllabus. Um, so your, present, uh, your presentation dates are listed in the syllabus, um, but as I said, I have to revise those because there are more people in the class now. Uh, so I'll get you those revise. I'll email those revised and updated dates to you this afternoon, and um, I'll get a revised version of the syllabus together uh, to bring to class on Wednesday. Right. But this is just so you have, for right now, all of the course policies and all of the due dates for everything. Yes, Jeremy. Am I still going to be first and last? You are still going to be first and last. Yes, it's alphabetical. So before midterm, Jeremy will be first. Seth will be last. After midterm, Seth will be first and Jeremy will be last. Right? The last will be first and the first will be last. Okay, so um, right, nobody, nobody who's here is not registered for this class, right? Everybody's already registered. You're not. Okay, um, but we're we're working on that. Okay, so the last date to add the class is Wednesday. <coughs> if you are not added to the class by Wednesday, you won't receive credit for it. Um, the last day to drop 
is Friday, right? And drop, everybody knows, is different from withdraw, right? Drop means this never appears on your transcript. Drop means it's like you were never here. You are a ghost student. If you withdraw later in the semester, that still appears on your transcript as a grade of W, but it doesn't count towards your GPA, right? So if you find that you're really struggling in this class at midterm, um, you know, that this is just not something that you're able to complete at this time, then withdrawal is an option, right? Often a better option than just taking the end. So the last date to withdraw is the 12th of October. And you'll notice, right, that all of the important dates, you know, when, you know, when things are due, when you can withdraw, when you can drop, right, that's all in this notes section on the right side of the syllabus. Um, does everybody understand how the reading schedule here works? <clears throat> People have had some confusion with this in the past, right? So if I say homework, read Shklovsky pages 8 to 14, I mean that I want you to do that for next time, right? That's not for today, that's for next time. And then from Wednesday, from Wednesday to Monday, right, you'll read the Brooks article and so on and so forth. Yes. And what's due on 25 and what's due on 25? Okay, that is because I constructed this from my survey class syllabus um, and I forgot to delete some things. So, so when I do it the midterm or at the end? At the end, at the end. So yeah. When I <laughs> when I fix the syllabus to get all the presentation dates right, um, I'll fix that too. But again, like at least now you have all the you know the, you have the reading schedule in front of you and that's What's really important. There is also a clean version of this without the text boxes and the pretty pictures posted to George Review. And I will post all assignments to George Review as well, um, but I will also give you physical paper copies because it's been my experience that when I post things to George Review, not everybody looks at it. So, yes? Will there be notes as well on the readings? Um, I know I'm not some, sure teachers, I some teachers. Some um, teachers. Oh, like, like like a study guide or something. Kind of. Uh, yeah, no, that no, the, 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 that that won't be your, your your study guide. Will be your class notes. Okay. okay um, so, if nobody has further questions about that, then let's talk a little bit about the other thing I gave you. Right, the instructions for uh, discussion groups, like group leaders. So. Each of you will have to lead discussion twice, once before midterm, once after. And what this means, it'll be up to you to introduce and explain the theoretical topic for that class period, as well as the essay the class read for that particular session. You'll also be asked to select a sample text. The class will then work together on, you know, to, in order to uh, test application of that particular theory. Right? And this can be anything that you think is suitable. Uh, it can be a poem, a song, a short video, a picture, right? Really kind of any form of cultural expression that is relatively brief, right? Like don't go dragging War and Peace or your Ulysses your in here, right? You know, don't go you know, dragging some three and a half hour epic movie. You can do movie clips. You can do movie, you can absolutely do movie clips, yes. As long as you keep it focused on the clip, right? Yes. Yes. So yeah, any, any, right, the word text in this course is going to be broadly applicable to just about any form of cultural expression. Yeah, Mickey. So, for the final paper, that has to be a book, though, then? Um, no. You, you can do your final paper on, once again, any form of text. Any kind of text you want to. <laughs> now, when I am leading discussion, I may foist things on you. Um, but yeah, when you guys are leading discussion, it's entirely up to you uh, what you want to use. Can we use like a 250 page book? Uh, to base the paper on? To base the paper on, yes. For the paper, yes. For, the, for, discussion, uh, for discussion, no. Right. 
Yeah, yeah, because that would just be too be too big. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, for the paper, sure. Absolutely. All right. So here's what I want from each of you, right? The list here. So I want each of you to be able to present a summary, a detailed summary, please, of the theory or approach under discussion. I want you to be able to give definitions of key terms that practitioners of this approach use. Because I mean, like a big part of this class is learning the jargon, right? Learning the kind of language that literary critics speak in. I want you to provide a list of important thinkers in this field and some discussion of their differences and similarities. That is, people who subscribe to a general critical orientation, right, aren't necessarily all going to agree with each other about everything, right? They may agree on sort of basic principles, but not on how to apply them. So I want to show that you, you, you can give me a brief overview of the particular field. Um, you're going to need a bibliography that includes at least three sources apart from the assigned essay, and that's sort of what this list I've got attached to this is, is to help you with. You don't have to consult all of those outside sources, right? These are just extra things that you can look at when you're putting together your presentation, right? And I have them arranged by critical topic. Are these in the book or something? They are not in the book. You'll have to go to the library. And for some of them, you may have to order from other libraries in the USG system. So get what you can from our library, but look like our library, God love them, they try but they're chronically underfunded. So particularly, sort of like anything that's published after 1975 uh, can be a little bit difficult to get your hands on. But the, the new interlibrary loan systems are actually really pretty easy to use. They're much easier to use than the old systems. Um, and stuff usually gets to you pretty quickly. Like where you have access to the entire library system of the USG, which taken, when you take every campus together, it adds up to one really good library. You just might have to wait a couple of days for some things. So it requires some planning ahead. This is one of the reasons why I want you to have these presentation assignments now so that you can prepare, yes. Um, okay, um, the other thing um, I want from you, right? You're, I want you to be prepared to answer questions from me and from your classmates. And I expect your classmates to show up with questions to ask. That's, that's going to be a key component of participation anywhere here, guys. Like, for each session, I want you to try to come to class with at least one question about the reading. All right. So you'll have to speak for about 25 minutes. It's generally going to be a good idea to practice beforehand and time yourself. Right? Make sure that you have enough material. And remember too, right, that I'm not going to penalize you if you go a little over 25 minutes. And also, that we tend to talk fast when we're nervous, right? So if you are timing yourself at like just at or just over 25 minutes, add a little bit more. Because you will speed up once you're in front of everybody. Right, you'll find you whiz through all that in 17 minutes and like, oh crap, what do I do? All right, so, um, as I said, I am also happy to help you with this if you need it. I actually recommend that before you do your presentation, you come sit down with me, show me the sources you're using, and talk with me a little bit about what you're gonna do. Right. I wanna make sure that everybody is set up for success here. Uh, okay, uh, finally, uh, as far as grading is concerned, I have this, you know, the point breakdown at the bottom of the page here. Right? So for quality of information, 30%. Clarity of presentation, 25%. Confidence and poise, 10%. How you handle the Q&A, 25%. And the quality of your support materials, 10%. Right? So go ahead and make visual aids if you want to. You will actually get extra points right, if you make good visual aids. Okay, anybody have any questions about these? Uh, no, we're not, when you say visual aid, we're not, you don't necessarily, necessarily have to do like a PowerPoint. No, you, know, you, you don't have to do a PowerPoint, no. In, in fact, like, in general, unless you have to show a lot of pictures, 
I would suggest that PowerPoint is not always a good idea. Right? PowerPoint is kind of mind-numbing. PowerPoint is not always a good tool for engagement. Um, so yeah, I would say like, if you want good visual aids, really, give the class something they can physically interact with, even if it's just sheets of paper. I have a personal vendetta against PowerPoints in general, anyways. That works. <laughs> I, I have a personal vendetta against the most forms of technology, even this <laughs> stupid thing. <laughs> Any, anything that was invented after I went to college, right, is uh, crime against nature. Have you seen Idiocracy? It's Several like, times. We're, we're doing that right now. We're yeah. Love it. Oh, okay. yeah, we are. But you, you, know, you know what gives me hope about Idiocracy? Is that at least by the end of it, when the people in charge have figured, oh, hey, this guy is smarter than we are, they put him in charge of things. <laughs> I don't, I don't see that. I don't see that happening. That's right. Rhonda's got what plants create. Didn't All right. Any other questions about any of this stuff? Any, uh, so these are just supplemental. Those are supplemental. Yeah. So yeah, you, you will not be expected to, to reference all of those um, outside sources in your discussion, right? Um, you will be expected, as I said, to reference at least three of them. I would say at least three, no more than five. <coughs> if you do more than five, then you're, just, you're, you're breaking your back unnecessarily, right? Three should be sufficient to present, to, pre to present a broad overview of the topic, which is what I'm asking you for. They'll start, um, well, let's see, when is the first one scheduled? Yep, first one is scheduled the 22nd, and yeah, Jeremy is going to be leading us through a discussion of uh, the new criticism. <coughs> so, yeah, we should probably talk very, very soon. All right, um, that it? Okay, so I want to talk to you a little bit today then about the history of critical theory and sort of why we do this and what sorts of things we do. Um, so I'm going to start in the early 1950s with a guy by the name of M.H. Abrams. So in 1953, Abrams, who was a scholar of Romanticism, wrote a book called The Mirror of the Land. And what really struck Abrams about the British Romantics at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th centuries, was just how much theorizing about poetry they did, right? In addition to churning out poems, they churned out reams and reams of critical work, sometimes just in private letters like uh, the poet John Keats, sometimes in like sort of like weighty doorstop weight treatises like uh, the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And so what he tries to do in this book is place this romantic tendency towards theorizing in a kind of broader tradition of European thought. And he does this first by breaking critical methodologies down into four basic categories which he calls mimetic, pragmatic, expressive, and objective. And each of these is concerned with the relationship between the work of art and one other thing. Mimetic theories Right. Does anybody know what mimetic means, what this word means? Mimetic. Pardon? It's mimetic. It's, yeah, it's the same root word. Yeah. Um, it comes from the Greek word mimesis, which means to imitate or imitation. Mine. Okay. Yep. So mimetic theories have to do with the relationship between the 
the work of art and the world that that work of art is meant to represent. Right. How does this work imitate something in the world? And how should it do so, right? Pragmatic theories are mostly concerned with the way a work of art affects an audience. Does this keep its audience entertained? Does it instruct the audience in any way, right? You know, are, does it provide moral or intellectual stimulation, right? What does this work of art do to the people who read it or view it? Expressive theories, and this was really sort of the innovation of the Romantics, are combined primar are concerned primarily with the author's creative process or with the artist's creative process. Um, if, how many of you have read? Uh, have, have most of you taken Brit Lit Two? You're taking Brit Lit Two with me now, right? And you're about to. You, you, the two of you are about to, right? Um, how many of you have read much romantic poetry? Um, in your, right, you took it with Dr. Brian last semester, right? Um, and the Romantics are kind of her thing. Um, so how do we generally think of the Romantics? Like what sort of poets do we think of them as? What do you think of them as being primarily concerned with? Romantics, they're more exaggerated, like the, the feeling of being correct. Okay, yeah, feelings, right? Yeah, feelings, you know, a lot of nature imagery, right? But yeah, the, what most romantic poetry and romantic theory is really about is the mind and the creative process. Right? What most romantic poems really do is describe a mental process. Right? Here is this thing out in nature. I am looking at it, I am describing it, and I am describing to you how I process this thing and spit my processing back out into the world. That's how a typical romantic poem works. And that's really kind of how their theory works as well. And finally, sort of towards the end of the 19th century, um, we get a lot of thinkers in France and in England in particular um, who have decided that they really don't care about anything outside of the pure work of art. So we get objective theories that are concerned only with the features of the work itself. Theorists who argue that you don't need any kind of outside knowledge or information to understand the work. Everything you need to appreciate it is right there in the work itself. So, to make this a little bit more concrete, let me sort of give you a little bit of historical continuum here, right? Because all of these theoretical approaches are, are associated with different historical eras as well, right? There's a, a definite historical progression here. Though most modern theories draw to some extent on all of these tendencies. And, pardon? I was talking to myself. Oh, that's okay. We all do it. It's a sign of intelligence. Um, so, one of the things I'm going to want all of you to do as you're reading the essays that I'm giving you is to think about what, how it fits into any of these categories, right? What is this particular theorist primarily concerned with, right? Are they concerned with the work in the world, with the work in the audience, so on and so forth, right? So this should help give you a framework for thinking through some of these essays. But we'll start with the mimetic theorists. Largely because this is the earliest tendency. So mimetic theory originates with the ancient Greeks who believed that all art was simply imitation of something in nature. 
whether this was a good thing or a bad thing. One of the most influential thinkers on the topic is Plato, who certainly felt that art, poetry in particular, was a bad thing. Do any of you know anything about Plato's philosophy, about what Plato's basic beliefs about the universe and everything in it were? <laughs> I forgot. I forgot. Right. <laughs> okay, so Plato is what's called an idealist. So he believes that there is a world of pure ideal forms that the material world is just an imitation of, right? Everything in the material world is an inferior copy of an idea. So something like this desk here, right? You can build a desk because there is an ideal form of desk that you can draw on, that you can mentally apprehend and recreate in the physical world. But the desk that you build in the physical world is never going to be as good as that ideal desk in your head, right? You can never quite live up to that ideal. And so, logically speaking then, if you're making art, then what are you doing? If we follow Plato's line of reasoning. Yeah, and what are you making copies of? What? Well, you're basically making copies of things that are already copies, right? So Plato argues that all art is a kind of inferior second order copy of something that's already an inferior first order copy. Also, that poetry, given that much ancient Greek poetry tends to, eh, you know, say, out and out glorify violence, can lead people astray morally. Uh, which part? <laughs> the whole thing? The last sentence. The last thing, okay. Because poetry often uh, out and out glorifies violence and uh, celebrates uh, you know, heroes who are better known for their physical strength or for their wiliness than for their moral character, um, it can lead people astray morally, right? If people imitate these inferior imitations, then it leads to societal breakdown, which is something that Plato was actually kind of witnessing in his lifetime, right? You know, in the aftermath of the wars between the Athenians and the Spartans. Right, Athenian democracy basically died uh, while he was uh, well during his lifetime. So yay. Uh, now in what way? Um, it's strong, but mm -hmm. not the brightest. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if those those who are familiar with the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? Yeah, uh, Gilgamesh. Although I, I think that the Epic of Gilgamesh is actually, at least in some ways, critical of. The hero in ways that sometimes the Greek epics aren't. Um, I think it works for what you were saying about Plato and mm -hmm. how you know the heroes are you know epically strong but not epically bright. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and I think you know the issue with Gilgamesh too is that, you know, his moral character, mm -hmm. at least for most of the epic, uh, until he finally figures out, oh hey. What I'm supposed to do There's is stick around and actually rule my people. Very end. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, his moral character. But is throughout weird. Yeah. most of it. Yeah. Just that. So, Plato's student Aristotle took a different view of both art and reality. By the way, you'll find most of Plato's art theory um, in a short dialogue called the Ion. Um, in which he has an argument with a reciter of poetry. And in book 10 of his treatise on politics, The Republic. So Plato's student, Aristotle, 
wrote what's actually probably about the first useful work of literary criticism. It's called The Poetics. And the poetics um, are actually, well, they're incomplete for one thing, right? Supposedly, they're a record of lectures that Aristotle gave on tragedy and on comedy. We have the one on tragedy. We don't have the one on comedy. And we only have the one on tragedy mostly because one of his students was taking notes while he was lecturing. So what Aristotle argues in opposition to his teacher Plato is that reality isn't just some realm of ideas that's floating in the ether that we can sometimes sort of draw upon. Reality is actually a process through which we bring ideas into the material world. So rather than simply imitating ideal forms, what the artist does is in fact add to and improve nature, right? By giving it structure, by giving it order. So if you take something like a Greek tragedy, if you just take the things that happen in a Greek play in isolation, it's a disconnected series of events, right? A disconnected series of actions that don't necessarily have any clear relationship to each other. But by shaping those events and actions into a plot, the poet has made them more coherent and more interesting, right? So for Aristotle, we don't just imitate nature, we actually improve upon it when we create art. Everybody still with me? Everybody still following me? Okay, so these are the two primary mimetic thinkers of the ancient world. And there's a definite, you know, historical relationship between the two, right? Teacher and student. Now, when we talk about pragmatic criticism, we're talking about a critical paradigm that dominated for a much longer stretch of time. So pragmatic, remind me, is concerned with what? Working audience. Yes, thank you, Jeremy. So when we're talking about pragmatic criticism, we are talking about the Romans, who didn't have as much use for airy theorizing as the Greeks did, right? The Greeks were philosophers and priests. The Romans were engineers. Medieval Europe, in large part because the church was, the medieval church was often a little bit funny about artistic expression, especially secular artistic expression. And so they kind of wanted to make sure that there was always some guiding moral or spiritual purpose in the creation of art. And this is also dominant in early modern Europe. So, you know, the Tudor period, um, the Stuart monarchy, and so what's loosely called the neoclassical period. Yeah, Jeremy. So, is this like more so uh, you have stories with a moral meaning in it? Um, sometimes. Some pragmatic critics are concerned with what we call didacticism, right? So let me just put this word up here for those who are not familiar with it. So didactic art is art that has some sort of explicit instructional purpose, right? It's meant to teach you something, whatever that thing is, whether it's moral instruction or whether it's, you know, it's a, um, like, I, I guess like a good, Contemporary example would be something like uh, like Sesame Street, right? Yes, it's supposed to entertain you, but it's also supposed to teach you how to count and how to read, 
um, and how to get along uh, with other small furry Muppets. What Muppets? I'm not sure of the name of it, but Japanese. They have a certain play where that comes into being, where it interacts with the way it's acted out with the different faces in that. Okay, I think you, you might be thinking of no drama. That's what it is. Where um, right, the, the, um, characters wear different masks to play, right. say, a the woman or a samurai or a demon or a ghost, right? Isn't it didactic? Isn't um, it? It's often it's historical. historical. And it is often, if it's not meant to directly uh, co communicate a moral message, mm -hmm. it is often directly intended to reinforce the power of the ruling regime and to make them look good, historically. Like, uh, a couple of you took World at One with me last semester, right? You might remember the Tales of the Heike, um, the Japanese chronicle we looked at towards the end of the semester. A lot of those stories get adapted into no plays by the descendants of the winning side. And the plays make it look like that side was destined to win and morally justified in winning. Or not? Loosely speaking, yeah, yeah, loosely, it, yeah. I mean, it's still, we're still thinking of it in terms of effect on the audience, so certainly, we're still looking at that from a sort of pragmatic critical viewpoint, certainly, if that makes sense. So that would collect propaganda. Yeah, um, pro if you're theorizing about propaganda, then yeah, you are theorizing from a pragmatic viewpoint. Because if you're thinking about propaganda, you are thinking primarily about what this is going to do to an audience. Right. The whole point is rhetorical, right? It's to persuade people, to convince people. So just a little bit of background on this stuff, right? Probably the first major pragmatic thinker is the Roman poet Horace. <clears throat> who wrote a verse treatise called the Ars Poetica, the Arts of Poetry. And Horace wrote in this treatise that the purpose of poetry is to delight and instruct. So poetry that does only one of those things is failing in its aims. It's supposed to teach a lesson, it's supposed to make that lesson go down a little bit easier, right? Like, uh, I don't know, how many of you know uh, the, the history of the gin and tonic? Like, why people drink gin and tonic? Um, it was to get British officers and officials in India and Africa to take the anti-malarial drug quinine, right? There's quinine in tonic water, but quinine is really bitter. It tastes terrible. So in order to sweeten it up, make it a little easier to take, you mix it with gin and some fizzy water and you know maybe a squeeze of lime, right? Mm -hmm. Makes it taste a lot more pleasant. So Horace is essentially recommending the poetic equivalent of gin and tonic, right? There's medicine in here, but you gotta sweeten it up a little bit so that people will take it. Now the other thing, that Horace uh, talks. The other big idea associated with him is the idea of decorum. Anybody familiar with this idea? Anybody know what, I, what, what we mean by decorum when we're talking about literature? Okay, decorum essentially means that you have to suit your work formally to the effect you're trying to produce and the audience you're trying to reach. So if you are trying to reach a more refined, educated audience, then you use smoother sounding, longer words. <coughs> you use topics that are a little bit more elevated. If you're trying to reach an audience of, you know, sort of the ordinary unwashed masses, right, you use much rougher, more simplistic language. Uh, rustic, clownish characters, right? Knockabout comedy, things like that. So you have to suit 
your work, according to Horace, to its audience, to its intended audience. Now, in the Middle Ages, the theologian Thomas Aquinas comes up with a scheme in his massive tome, the Summa Theologica, for getting more out of Scripture. So, according to the medieval world, uh, Catholic worldview, the whole world is a book in which God has hidden certain encoded messages, right? Behind every flower, every tree, every rock lies some sort of spiritual message. And it is up to human beings to decode those messages. Now, <clears throat> Aquinas is applying the same kind of logic to scripture by suggesting we do a kind of fourfold reading. Right. The first level of reading is the historical or literal level, right? Just what happens in the biblical narrative. And the remaining three he regards as one level that he calls spiritual, but they're really kind of separated out um, into different methods. Uh, the first of these is the typological. And a typological reading suggests that events in the Old Testament prefigure events in the New Testament, right? So everything that happens in the Old Testament is an analog in some way of something that's going to happen in the New Testament, right? So the typological reading is focused on the past, right? Reading the present in terms of the past. The, the, third, uh, the third level here he calls the moral. And this is concerned primarily with the ethical lessons you can draw from reading scripture. Right, so this is concerned with your behavior in the presence. And the final and fourth level is probably the weirdest and the hardest to explain. He calls it the anagogical. And it suggests that events in scripture predict certain future events in Christian history. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, the anagogical realm is sort of concerned with right, things that the Bible prophesies that explicitly coming out and saying this is prophecy, right? So, you know, like rep, you know, prefigurations of the end times and things like that. So, right, each of these is concerned with a different dimension of time. So, what other medieval theorists started doing, like Aquinas is only looking at this in terms of scripture, right? He's a monk, he's a very devout monk, and a lot of very devout monks are kind of suspicious of non-religious art. So what, Aquin what other thinkers like the poet Dante Alighieri do with this scheme is start applying it to secular literature. And soon, thinkers all over Europe, because remember, like, there was a common lingua franca among educated people, right? Everybody who was educated spoke and read Latin, so they communicated via letters. And they started applying this sort of form of moral and allegorical thinking to literary texts. So this was hugely influential. Now, by the time Catholic dominance has broken up, in Europe, by the time of the Protestant Reformation, um, there are still people making kind of moral and religious arguments for the value of poetry. Um, one of, it's not the most original, but it's one of the most influential of these is by uh, the poet 
Sir Philip Sidney. And Sidney wrote his Apology for Poetry. in response to a Puritan pamphlet attacking poetry called The School of Abuse. So what the author of The School of Abuse wrote was that poetry, one, is a waste of time, two, is based upon and spreads lies, three, teaches people sinful things and to admire and desire sinful things, and four, if Plato banished poets from his republic, so should we. So that argument from past authority, right? Now, Sidney's response is that poetry in many early societies was the main source of education, right? This was how tri you know, tribal histories were kept. Um, you know, this is how people remembered um, to, you know, their history of sort of important cultural concepts. Right, they were communicated by poets, not by scholars. Secondly, that poetry can and should exert a moral influence on people. That in most societies, poets are generally revered, and so why shouldn't we revere them? You know, that Plato is actually an anomaly in that. And that through, instead of simply spreading lies, what poetry does is delights and instructs, right? Through creative allegory, right? Through the creation of imaginative schemes that make the lesson go down a little easier. All right, so that's pragmatic criticism. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit as well we already kind of discussed this, but we'll just, just to quickly review. Expressive uh, criticism is concerned with what? The work and the author. Yes, the work and the author. So we're only going to focus on one of these thinkers, mostly because we're running a little bit short on time, but also because we could get bogged down in a lot of uh, funny details here. Um, so Samuel Taylor Coleridge, have any of you read Coleridge's poetry? If you've ever read Coleridge, uh, what, what Coleridge works are you familiar with? What do you know? Rhyme the Ancient Mariner. Uh, yeah, the Rhyme the Ancient Mariner, yep. Yeah, which is also an Iron Maiden song. <laughs> yes, it's basically, um, it's a spark notes version of the poem with an eight minute bass solo in the middle. That's so good. <laughs> so Coleridge. Dejection too, right? Uh, dejection and Ode, yes, it's Coleridge. Coleridge wrote. Yeah, Col Coleridge wrote a lot of song, wrote a lot of poems about being depressed and a little bit high. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so Coleridge. Let me just get his dates right, 1772 to 1834. Now, Coleridge wrote a lot, of, he wrote a lot more criticism than he wrote poetry, but the big critical work for which he is known is the Biographia Literaria. Never mind that much of it is plagiarized uh, from various German late 18th century philosophical sources, right? He still manages to synthesize all this stuff into something kind of new. Now, what Coleridge is mostly concerned with in this book is defining the imagination in the way it works, right? So he divides up the imagination into two main portions, right? The first and the lesser function he calls the fancy. So what the fancy is for Coleridge really is just a form of memory, right? You take in sense impressions and rearrange them in different patterns without fundamentally changing them. And this 
is how he argues much of the poetry of the previous generation works, right? Neoclassical poets were kind of wary of innovation, right? They tended to write poems that looked and sounded very much alike, right? Everything had to be iambic pentameter, heroic couplets. They tended to draw on the same banks of imagery, right? Uh, mostly Greek and Roman myth combined with the British historical presence. And uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, so the fancies were just about remembering things and rearranging them. You don't really make anything new with it. The imagination, on the other hand, almost always spelled with a capital I, takes in sense impressions, melts them down, and creates something new out of them. Right, so uh, to use an example from Greek arguments about art, right? Has anyone ever seen the god Poseidon? No. No one has ever seen Poseidon, right? So, <laughs> yeah. But people built statues of him, right? So how is it that you can build a statue of something you've never seen? How is it you can make an art object that represents a thing you have never seen? Well, you do it by taking in various sense impressions, right? So you, you know, you're trying to create a god, you know, an image of a god, right? So you think first of an idealized human form, right? Okay, I've seen, good, I've seen very good looking people before. What do they look like? And Poseidon is the god of the sea, right? So I combine that with some kind of nautical imagery, right? So maybe, you know, he holds a, a fishing spear and a net, right? You know, maybe we work some sort of wave motif into his hair or beard or whatever, right? So what you do by using the imagination right, is you're able to create the image of something that you've not directly experienced, right? By taking things you have directly experienced, melting those down and recombining them. So this is entirely about mental processes, right? This is entirely about the human creative process. So just to finish up here, we're gonna be talking about some objective theories over the next couple of days. But just to give you a kind of introduction to how objective theory works, objective